Um, so let's start with early signs of keratoconus. You know, Professor Bellin has very nicely described how do we detect progression of the disease. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, as we do more cross-linking, we do realize that there are cases which are hard to detect. Um, early signs include Flesher's ring, both striae. Um, you can actually look at the late signs as well, Munson signs, Rizzuti signs, and Cornell scar. When you have a case like that, you really don't need uh, to use anything even corneal topography, really. This is a clinical diagnosis of keratoconus. So in terms of diagnosis, uh, for those of you who trained before, sort of in the era of early 2000, you know what BKG is. Uh, it basically used to tell us uh, the interior surface map, and you can pretty much see uh, the steepening there, inferior steepening. But again, if you have a topographic map looking like this, most likely you'll have clinical diagnosis of keratoconus already set in there. Uh, then came the orb scan, uh, which gave us a bit more information uh, on the posterior surface of the cornea. You could see a posterior ectasia, and you know more and more research went to do the importance of looking at the posterior corneal surface. But again, the repeatability of orb scan was seriously questioned in subsequent publications. Um, came the image, then came the, the era of shine plug imaging, where we started uh, to look at uh, early cases of keratoconus, uh, we, we had a better view of the posterior cornea. Uh, we started giving more importance to the elevation of the posterior corneal surface. You could actually see, uh, to a certain extent, how the disease progresses um, in some cases. Typical topographic images of keratoconus, you can see early bow tie, asymmetric bow tie. You can see a displaced cone, inferior cone. You can actually see a, a pellucid uh, like, like uh, cornea there. And sometimes you have a more central cone uh, which sort of can progress to a kind of globus-like picture in some cases. So basically, this is this is just an image telling us how the sorry how the changes on corneal topography they sort of mimic the changes that you can actually see on anterior segment tomographic images. The apex of the cone almost coincides with the area of maximal thinning in most of the cases of keratoconus. So corneal tomography really changed the way we looked at keratoconus. But is the diagnosis, whatever we're doing, is it early enough? So let's look at this case. This is an interior segment uh, OCT image. You can look at the K values of 42.1, 41.6, average K is about 41.9. Corneal thickness, if you look at the center, is uh, apex, apex is about 596 microns, so fairly looking, uh, normal looking cornea. Uh, and this is, there's an ectasia screening program uh, given in, in different uh, machines. So interior segment OCT has some of the uh, units does ha do have those. You can see there's a 0% similarity if you look at this image. And this is the pentacam of the same patient, k is is 41.5, K2 highlighted though it's 42.2, and Kmax is 43.1. And this is the contralateral eye of the same patient. So looking at this, if someone asks you, is this a, a possible candidate for refractive surgery? Um, the answer might be yes to a certain extent. Obviously you have to look at the patient as well. But if you look at this, the contralateral eye of the same patient, uh, there's, so this, this is a huge no. Obviously this is a keratoconus patient, who's got highly asymmetrical keratoconus if you look at the left eye as compared to the right eye. So this, this is a very beautifully written editorial in BJO 2014, uh, early diagnosis, does it matter in keratoconus where uh, the authors have sort of moved a bit more towards non-tomographic diagnosis or at least the importance of non-tomographic diagnosis. Um, this is what has been discussed in that review article, the use of wavefront agrometry Im implication of corneal biomechanical changes uh, in, in diagnosis of keratoconus, FTIR, and optical quality analysis system. We did have access to optical quality analysis system a few years ago, and it does pick up cases uh, of keratoconus, but the repeatability, again, was seriously questionable in, in most of uh, these devices. So today we're gonna obviously focus on corneal biomechanics and the importance of corneal biomechanics in keratoconus. A normal cornea is made up of parallel collagen fibers. There are bridges or cross links between these collagen fibers. And obviously in keratoconus, we know already there's a reduction and degradation um, in these collagen fibers. Got stuck again. All right, so why evaluation of corneal geometry and optical properties has been widely applied in diagnosis of keratoconus, understanding the biomechanical properties will hopefully elucidate the pathogenesis of the disease as well. So an example that I 
you know, fairly commonly used structural loss versus functional loss in glaucoma. This is, um, if you see changes on the visual field, you probably miss the boat to a large extent. And that's why we have other di means of diagnosis, diagnosing glaucoma at a very early stage. Uh, these are devices that can be practically used, not practically, these are the devices that can be used for, the, uh, for to measure the biomechanical properties. And actually only two are more practical. And obviously one is more practical than the other. ORA, uh, for those of you who are using ORA, it's more useful for the glaucoma specialist than cornea specialist. So today we're gonna focus on Corvus. I got stuck again. Oops. All right. Okay, it's an ultra high speed shine plug camera. It captures corneal deformation response dynamics at the rate of more than 4,000 image, image frames per second. So basically, you see the corneal deformation response um, in, for, against a puff of air. That's how uh, the images on, on Corvus ST they look like. Uh, see the, the part of the video is working. Yeah, so when the puff of air hits the cornea, it basically bends the cornea, and there are a bunch of measurements that are made during that time. So we initially, we looked at the repeatability of Corvus in normal eyes and in, in keratoconus size as well. So we basically found that uh, Corvus it does very well in terms of repeatability and reproducibility in normal eyes normal eye, normal eye and keratoconus size. And there were, there were significant differences when you look at um, normalized and keratoconus size in terms of corneal deformation response. Based on this, we actually, this was presented way back an hour or three years ago, DA ratio one, which is the deformation amplitude at one millimeter from the, from the apex of the cornea, and DA ratio two, uh, we actually found the AUC uh, was pretty high, it was 0.95 in DA ratio one and DA ratio two. We then looked at the uh, comparison of dynamic uh, parameters, the corneal uh, parameters with tomographic measurements. Uh, the results were quite encouraging. We actually found that um, the diagnostic ability of Corvus parameters was at least as good as Pentacam, was not better um, in, in any case. The AUC was quite high, more than 90% with Pentacam as well as with Corvus. Um, a relatively new uh, index, Corvus Biomechanical Index, basically it, it takes into account four parameters, uh, if you, the pointer here. DA ratio keeps on jumping on its own. Are you controlling it? Okay, thank you. DA ratio, uh, the highest concavity radius, uh, ambrosial relation thickness, and the stiffness parameter. Uh, the standard deviation of all these parameters, they are actually brought to a random forest plot. Uh, plot and the analysis yields what we what we label as is a single index called CBI or Corvus Biomechanical Index. Uh, the the value of more than 0.5 it means the case is suspicious. It's not a normal cornea. It's a cornea which probably has uh, jeopardized biomechanical properties. We looked at um, three sets of patients: normal, uh, form first keratoconus patients, which typically was, is defined as uh, keratoconus in a patient uh, which is not detectable by any means of corneal imaging um, in one eye where the patient has got frank keratoconus in the other eye. And the third group consisted of keratoconic eyes. You can see uh, the graph on the right side, actually the, the AUC for CBI was quite high uh, using Corvus uh, biomechanical index. Uh, this is something which is relatively new. Uh, so the concept was if we can combine uh, the properties of Corvus, the biomechanical indices, and also we take the best of Pentacam, the D index, and combine, combine both to generate a tomographical biomechanical index. So you can see this is how the, the display looks like on the left. You can see those four parameters, DA ratio, integrated radius, ARTH, and stiffness parameter. And on, on your right, actually, you can see the Pentacam four maps for refractive indices. And at the bottom, you can see CBI, BAD, and TBI all together on the same plot. Going back to the first case that I showed, same patient, K values of 41.9, almost normal looking corneal thickness. Ectasia screen shows it, the patient does not have keratoconus, most likely. Uh, BAD, the D value is only 0.42. And once you do CBI, it shoots up to one. You can see that uh, bottom right. So the patient actually uh, has subclinical keratoconus, if, the, if, if at all. 
Um, same patient, if you do the TBI, the TBI is actually more than 0.5, it's uh, 0.84 if you look, to, look at the bottom bar there. So the same patient has got high CBI and high TBI, although normal looking um, corneal tomography. So to conclude, um, Corvus does have a role in possibly diagnosing the disease at a very early stage. Um, I, I must say that Corvus does not have a role in looking at the progression of the disease. So we still have to rely very much at the Pentacam and the ABCD that has been discussed nicely by Professor Bellin. Uh, we do use Corvus, uh, although this is not FDA approved yet, we have a unit for refractive surgery screening. Um, it doesn't sound very good when you have to cut down your number of cases uh, based on the results on CBI. Uh, it does help us uh, for proper selection of cases for collagen cross-linking. And we believe that it might have some role and looking at the efficacy of various treatment modalities, especially collagen cross-linking in the future. Thank you very much for your attention.